Good evening, everyone. I'm Christiane Amanpour, and welcome to the program. Rwanda's genocide was the most efficient of modern times. It took just three months to massacre up to one million people, mostly Tutsis, with clubs, machetes and bare hands. This was the television age, and yet the world still stood by and literally did nothing. When the carnage ended, Rwanda had a new leader, Paul Kagame. Now he's trying to power his country into the Singapore of Africa. His government has also convened thousands of local courts to deliver justice after the genocide. But it's not the only way victims and killers are trying to reconcile. Rwanda has made reconciliation a centerpiece of its recovery with clubs and re-education camps. I met Ephugenia on a beautiful Sunday morning in church. After mass, she invited me home. There, in her unadorned hilltop house, no electricity and no running water, I saw something extraordinary. Ephigenia was preparing a plate of food and serving it to Jean Bosco Bizimana, one of the men who murdered five of her children. It's amazing for us to sit here and share food with families who've been through so much. Jean Bosco is married to Ephigenia's basket weaving partner and after seven years in prison, he returned to face the woman he had all but destroyed. And what did you say to her? You looked her in the eye, and what did you say to her? The first time we spoke, we discussed the horrible things we did to them without holding anything back. And did you expect Iphigenia to forgive you and give you mercy? I felt that they would forgive me. Justice is a vital part of Rwanda's reconciliation process. In villages around the country, traditional community trials called gachachas help the victims confront the killers in front of all of their neighbors. Jean Bosco, did you go to the gachacha court? Yes in front of everyone. I openly said what I did. I told my brothers and asked for forgiveness. This is an example of the extraordinary length that Rwanda's president is going to to move forward. His methods are winning praise, but also vilification. Joining me now to discuss all of this, a former speaker of the Rwandan parliament, Joseph Seberenzi, who lost most of his family to the genocide, and Philip Gureyevich, who reported extensively on the massacres in his Pulitzer Prize winning book, We Wish to Inform You That Tomorrow We Will Be Killed With Our Families. Welcome to both of you gentlemen. Thank you. I want to ask you, Joseph, because your family lived through this. Yes. What do you make of today's reconciliation attempts, what you just saw on the screen. It does not impress me, unfortunately. It doesn't? It doesn't. Uh, it doesn't uh, uh, because we, we don't really uh, deal with uh, the, the fundamental issues that led to the genocide. What do you mean? Uh, what I mean is uh, this genocide was mainly caused by a, a political uh, struggle over power between Hutu and Tutsi, and that issue is not being dealt with. Well, let, me, let me ask you, do you not think it's also personal that also people need to try to reconcile? Absolutely. People, and that's uh, what I say in my book, people need to reconcile individual to individual, but also community with community. And uh, I have seen people uh, getting together after the genocide. I have seen people going to others and uh, ask for forgiveness and have seen other people who have forgiven and they have started living to get together again. But when you look at uh, the gachacha, which is uh, uh, traditionally a way of bringing together uh, the people in the community, uh, tell what they went through uh, and uh, admit what they have done and then ask for forgiveness. The Gachacha today is uh, basically a, a court of court of law, and I I believe that that type of court should be in the court system and have a Gachacha 
doing just reconciliation. And your book is God Sleeps in Rwanda. We're going to ask you in a moment about what your family went through, but I want to at this point ask Philip, because you documented the incredible massacres that went on in your book. Do you think that this kind of local people's court is of no value? No, I think it's of mixed value. I think it's a very complicated process. So I think what happened is essentially you had a situation where you had basically hundreds of thousands of people who were accused of uh, participating in either directly or indirectly in murder, uh, in political murder, in organized murder, in state-sponsored massacres. And the court system of this country, the United States, would have been incapable of dealing with 200,000 murder cases. When I was first in Rwanda reporting on this, it was O.J. Simpson time on CNN. And, and frankly, what one saw then was people looking at that and saying, this is what they want us to do, a real murder trial? So they tried in the court system. And uh, that court system didn't have the capacity. They invented this gachacha idea. And it's mixed. It's, it's not strictly what one would call justice. Uh, in the sense that it's not uh, a full, complete hearing in a court system, and yet it is an attempt to largely, and very few uh, survivors are satisfied with this, liberate a population and reintegrate a population that by most systems of justice would spend the rest of its life in prison. By a strict system of law, you would not have people being let out of prison, and the country couldn't thrive. And just to point out, mm -hmm. just this week, a uh, genocidaire has been released on appeal, and a couple more have been arrested. So this process is ongoing. It's I want to bring up the pictures, Joseph, of yes. what happened to your family. Mm -hmm. There are three pictures, amongst others, that you have in your book. This one is the wedding of your brother, correct? Yes, this is a wedding of my brother, and my brother is in the middle here. And he was killed with his wife uh, and their three children. Uh, How many of these people survived? This is you here, that, right? That's me. I survived uh, because I was not in a country uh, during the genocide. And the, his, here is my brother, uh, uh, Emmanuel, he was not in a country. Uh, that's why he survived. And the, my sister here, who was married to a Hutu, and the Hutu protected her. And I have a, ne a, a niece here and a stepsister. All others, I think, they, they were killed. This and as we show the other picture of, right. of your family, what, who are these, first of all? These are, uh, are the, in the middle here, this is my sister, Edith, and here is her uh, uh, daughter, uh, and, they were, and here is my, my nephew, uh, her, her, her uh, son, uh, Jean Bosco, who lives in Rwanda, and he's the only one who survived in a family of five. When you came back, mm -hmm. you met the mayor of the village, who was responsible. I met uh, the mayor who was responsible. Basically, he, he encouraged people to go after the surviving Tuts, and he told the, the, the people in the village that they should make sure no Tuts survives, because if any survives, then they would take over the land. Did you reconcile with him? No, that's not reconciliation. When I found him, uh, he was a man, uh, a shell of man. He has uh, lost weight. Uh, he was really suffering in a prison that was meant to have uh, 1,000 people, but he was having 8,000 people. So he was suffering. Uh, I asked him if he was involved, and he said he was not. But I did not believe. But because I saw him uh, as a human being, really suffering, a person who used to be our friend, despite all he, he has done, I decided to give him some money to buy food. So These that are the is, stories that are incredible, that he yes. decided to give him money to buy food, that the uh, Ephigenia makes food and has Sunday lunch with the man who was responsible for killing her family. Is this real, Philip, or is this state-managed reconciliation? Yes and yes. Um, it, Will it's, it survive there, if it's, it's the it, latter? It's a balance between the two. And I think what you see is a state that says, there's no way we can give survivors back what they lost. You saw the numbers. That's a totally typical family portrait in the sense that the, uh, of the numbers and percentage of people who have been killed. There are people all across Rwanda who have an experience like that. And you can't give them back the dead. And the government can't satisfy them politically. It can give them security, and it can give them some sense that a, an accounting has taken place. And when I first went to Rwanda, and this has gone in stages. You can see the stages that survivors, that perpetrators, that political structures have gone through. When I first went, the survivors said, at the very least, we have to have an acknowledgment of wrongdoing before we can live side by side. And that has started to emerge, because the system of gachacha rewards 
confession. But of course, that leads to the cynical view that you're not in jail for having committed genocide, but for having failed to confess. And so there's, there's still resentment. And I met people who had real reconciliations like the stories you've heard. And I met people who said, you know, it's on the surface. We do it for the government. Um, it's the government's program. Uh, that's between two hearts, and that's not happening in my heart. And, and, yeah. and I think the government now feels it, has to, it can't do more than that, but it can try and fight other things like poverty and so forth. Well, let mm -hmm. me ask you, Joseph, yes. uh, you are Tutsi. Yes, I am. It was the Tutsis who bore the brunt of the massacres. Yes. And you came back and went into government. You became yes. Speaker of the Parliament, mm -hmm. and then you left. Why? I left because I had a disagreement with, uh, uh, with the ruling party. Why? Um, Why? Because uh, uh, in my view, uh, after the genocide with all our people dead, we had to have a priority. That, that priority should have been to make sure we build institutions that are strong so that what happened, it does not happen again. But uh, instead of political and politically, judicial? with the judiciary that is strong, with the parliament that is strong, able to control the executive branch of government, because the reason the genocide took place in Rwanda it was because we had a president with too much powers, ministers with too much powers. So those powers had to be diverted into other institutions. We wanted to build a, a civil society. Uh, by doing that, it's the uh, best way for us to prevent another catastrophe, but it was not being done that way. We are going to take this and go yes. to a break and come right back and talk about power and what is next for Rwanda in a moment. The genocide in Rwanda should never, ever have happened, but it did. The international community failed Rwanda and must always, that must always leave us with a sense of bitter regret and abiding sorrow. I wish I'd intervened in Rwanda and I have spent the rest of my life and will spend the rest of my life trying to make it up to them. Those are strong words of regret from the former Secretary General of the United Nations, Kofi Annan, and the former U.S. President, Bill Clinton. Joseph, are those words enough? I think those words are enough on one uh, aspect, because it's good to recognize what happened and to say it was really bad. We did not do what we had to do. But it's not enough because the same people who just spoken, they are not doing enough today to make sure to, it does not happen again. What do you mean precisely? We, we uh, left off talking okay. about politics. Yeah, we, what, we do you, are, what does he mean? Yeah, exactly. I, I don't know what he means. To, to, I mean, I, to today, me, yeah, it seems. Yeah, exactly. Today we have uh, a, a very strong president. When you read the, the US uh, country report every year, uh, they say that Rwanda is a, a, a republic with a, a very strong presidency, which means the president is too powerful. So. I, I think I, I, instead I, I, of having a, a president that is too powerful, we should have like a parliament powerful, a judiciary powerful, a civil society that is powerful. That's really? it, it's promising. There's no question that the desire for any country that's trying to establish a kind of long-term stability is, is to build institutions. The question is at what speed and, at what, and, and where that's going to happen. And it's going to accrue in, inevitably in a situation like this to those who have the power and the momentum and the uh, ability. Uh, you know, Next a lot of the year, people, like Joseph, when he came into Parliament in 1996, he'd never been in politics before. He was elected by his party, not by popular plebiscite, and he became Speaker on the first day as a matter of manipulation by Kagame. He was appointed essentially so by Kagame's party. So next year there's party. going to be an election in Rwanda. A presidential election. Who's going to win? Kagame's going to win. He may not run unopposed, but he will effectively be unopposed because nobody expects to be able to contend with him. So this brings up a very but sensitive point a, because pre President Kagame is a very controversial figure. Yes. There are many people who believe without him, the success of Rwanda today would mm. no way have happened, and others who believe that it's too much autocracy. Can I just put up some figures just to point out what I mm. mean? The economy of Rwanda, 
Look at that. In 2006 yes. compared to 2008, it's shooting up. Look at this. Starbucks and Costco, the two biggest buyers of Rwandan coffee beans, and Kagami aims to quadruple the per capita income by 2020. And by yeah. all indicators, Rwanda is the engine of its region. Is there a case to be made that in countries like this, there needs to be a strong, benevolent dictatorship? I don't agree with that, 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 that uh, benevolent uh, dictatorship. Philip, you know, these achievements... I don't see I that that's the aim. I think that the, you know, the, the question is that how do you build a, a government from... We're talking about the building of a state. People talk about nation building. We're talking about the building of a state from total destruction, right? From something considerably worse than zero. And you look at the way that the modern democracies of the West evolved. They did not evolve by fiat, by a couple of NGOs and UN organizations and Western democracies declaring that they should be democracies. There was the evolution of a middle class. There were industrial revolutions. There were enormous power struggles. There was the colonization of poorer, weaker countries around the world, the extraction of their wealth and the claiming it as one's own right in order to make oneself a strong government at home. All of these things we deny them any possibility of doing except by being labeled as criminals. When one sees some of that happening, the question is which direction is it going in? Is it going towards a new kind of Mobutism, which is the accusation? No, because it's not about that kind of dependency. Is it going towards dictatorship or is it going towards something which we won't know until it's Kagame's turn to step down in 2017 okay, and whether, whether then we'll find out whether it's true that he will be, as he says he wants to be, the first retired civilian leader of Rwanda ever. What do you say to those statistics and to what the, actually your country has become? You know, Kagame deserves a credit for the economy. He deserves the credit for the stability. But he, he, he could have done more. You know, Rwanda, people in Rwanda are hardworking people. They work quick. Uh, in Rwanda, people listen to their leaders and they are ready to do what they, they are asked to do. So Kagame could have used all that and could have used this international support, uh, the, the nations, uh, the support to the budget, all that, to start building some, uh, some uh, institutions to make sure uh, we are building institutions and those institutions are the ones that can protect people. But it has been 15 years since the genocide ended. And some people say the genocide uh, crumbled everything, but. Uh, there was something there, and we could have built slowly. 15 years later, we could have started having some democracy, but today it's one man controlling everything, and uh, I am afraid. Le you're afraid? Yes. Let me read you these statistics and tell me what you make of this. Women in Rwanda have yes. been the engines of the revival, it seems. They mm -hmm. hold some 56% of the seats in parliament. They make up 36% of President Kagame's cabinet. 16.7% of ministers are women and they hold top jobs in ministries of commerce, agriculture and infrastructure. They make up 55% of the workforce and own 41% of yes. Rwandan business. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is an enormous achievement for any country. And I think what you're going to see is that you see that the way that Kagame and appeals to international public opinion. He's not going to do it by saying, I've got mm. the broadest based uh, competitive party system and multi-party democracy, obviously. He's going to do it by saying, we're taking initiatives on a lot of issues that you do care about, women's rights, economic rights. There's national health insurance in Rwanda. Uh, there was no such thing. There's national education. There was no such thing. Hutus win scholarships. That's what changes minds. And it's about changing minds. And to a large degree, and this is the claim, I'm, I'm saying the claim mm -hmm. that one as a journalist goes and looks at is with all of these extraordinary statistics and this incredible set of problems and challenges, are things moving towards a change of minds? Because the claim is, well, can you build all of these institutions until you have a class of people who are educated in and have brought themselves around to what it's like to be a middle income country? To, is there anybody who could run against Kagame so right now who could offer this. an alternate mm -hmm. economic plan? Is there anybody and can, what do you hope for the future? What do you see for the future? You know, um, unless Kagame changes, and uh, I can hope and uh, hope uh, Gurevich is, is right, Kagame can change and uh, I believe anyone can change. But if he does not and continue on this path, 
I fear that there can be another catastrophe. Because well, there is a catastrophe a brewing next door, isn't there? I'm not brewing, yes. brewed next yeah, door absolutely. in Congo. Yeah. And many people look very askance at President Kagame over this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Kagame. Yes, so that story is shifting yeah. a good deal again to suddenly realize that a lot of the problem has been generated by the ongoing presence of the genocidal army albeit a remnant in uh, Congo, which has visited an enormous amount of grief on Congolese Tutsis as well, mm -hmm. and who are now being arrested finally in Germany. Their leadership has been operating out of Germany. So, you know, you hear that Kagame has yeah. unanimous international support driven by guilt over the genocide. France has never stopped trying to crush him and delegitimate him. Mo many in the academic community totally uh, seek to delegitimate him. In Germany, they're supporting and keeping protected the rulers of uh, an organization, the same organization that killed those tourists in the Windy yeah. Forest a few years back. This is a very complicated, multifaceted thing, and any single villain theory should immediately be looked at askance. Where do you think your country's headed in the next year, five years? You know, next year we're having elections, but as we said, no one will have that to I mean, dare to, to run against the president, and if we have someone who does, uh, inevitably Kagame is going to win because he's not ready to, to go. Uh, so my point is this. Uh, we have achieved this a lot in economy. We have a women in parliament. We have this. Those are easy things to do. The tough things to do are how do you manage the power between Hutu and Tutsi? That's an issue not dealt with. It's like we are passing it on to future generations. We have this justice uh, uh, going on. Of course, we have these people who were involved in genocide who were punished, which is good. But at the same time, you hear people among the Hutu population who say, the, some Tutsi have killed our loved ones. Tens of thousands of people were killed in, 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 in Congo, were killed in Rwanda before genocide, during genocide, and after genocide, and no justice about them. All that is creating frustration. That frustration is the same frustration Tutsi had before 1990, and it can translate into another violence. So we need to confront those tough issues, not just women in parliament, economy. Those are easy to do to build infrastructure. Do you think that this is boiling under the ashes? I think there's an element of the, a lot of these issues have not been totally sorted out. There's, uh, I, it would be insane to imagine that they could be. And that's why the country remains riveting, because it's made more progress than anybody could have imagined. You were there 15 years ago. And it has so far to go. And at this moment, this is the constellation of things. And the question is, can minds change? I think truly. The future lies with a different generation. And when you go there, the conflict is not all Hutu Tutsi. It's the younger generation looking at the older generation and saying, we're not sure we want to inherit the world the way you've configured it. And you're starting to hear people speak up. And that's a big change. And you hear it quietly and in different forms, maybe not in politics, sometimes in art. But you hear it, and that's new. Riveting indeed, and we'll continue to watch it. Philip Gurevich, Joseph Herenzi, thank yes. you so much indeed for joining us. Yes.